Um, how, how many, not to put people on the spot, but how many people here are patients? Okay. All right. Actually, really good turnout. And how many of you have or have had graft-for-soaps disease in the mouth? Okay, good. So there's a reason why you're here. <laughs> and how many of you have some sort of specialist other than your transplant physician that you've been able to talk to about your mouth? Okay, about a quarter maybe. And that's that's pretty. So I've I've given uh, I've given this talk. Uh, I think this is maybe the fifth time, and it's always interesting to see sort of where people are coming from and the amount of sort of clinical support that they have. And it's pretty typical. I mean, most places do not have an oral medicine service. Most people, most of the most most even the you know the big transplant centers in the country, don't have even a single person you know like me. Uh, we're pretty unique in the sense we have, you know, a faculty of five and, you know, so pretty much someone's away, somebody's out, somebody else can see a patient. We've got somebody that can see patients in the hospital, um, in our clinic, at the Dana-Farber Clinic, on occasion now over at Mass General, or they can send patients over to us. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a nice service to have, and I, I hope with time that, you know, all centers will eventually have someone like, like us. There's a lot that I can sort of provide within the, the cancer center that goes well above and beyond just the transplant patient population. Um, so if you can advocate among your centers, by all means, make noise. So I'm going to talk about um, graft disease in the mouth today, uh, an area that, uh, you know, I... I sort of hold near and dear and uh, really enjoyed all of the, my time and experience sort of working in this field, working with the, the physicians, but also, of course, families and of all of you, the patients. So Graffer's host disease, um, as, as all of you know, it, you know, it can sort of affect everyone differently. Um, it's not sort of a one-size-fits-all condition, but, you know, there's a lot of areas, in a lot of patients, there's going to be a lot of sort of similar themes in certain areas that tend to be affected more than others. So the mouth, first and foremost, is one of the most commonly affected sites, and I'll, I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, there's a wide range of signs and symptoms, and that's just because, you know, graft host disease affecting anywhere, you're going to have some patients where it's fairly minimal and some, some patients where it's really quite severe, advanced, you know, much more refractory to treatment. But also when we talk about the mouth, it's, it's not really just one condition. In some ways, it's almost two or three different conditions. And so I'll explain that a little bit because I may see one patient who's referred, you know, entirely for sort of one set of symptoms and complications, another patient who I'm seeing for something completely different. And if I just think, oh, you know, topical steroids or oh, fluoride, you know, that may help one patient really well, but it's not going to help the other patient. Um, when we think about graft host disease in the mouth, most of the time what we are talking about, though, is what I have written here as lichenoid inflammation. So this is, this is a technical term, but it really describes the type of inflammation that affects the inside of the mouth. So sort of that rash-like um, condition that, you know, causes the mouth to be uncomfortable and feel funny and, um, and look different. And I'll, obviously I'll talk a lot about that. Um, it also can affect the lips. So the lips are very, very frequently affected. And interestingly, it, it's sort of an extension of the mouth. Um, patients who have extensive skin graft host disease, but they don't have an involvement of the mouth, the lips usually are not going to be affected. So it sort of extends sort of outwards from the mouth. Um, dry mouth is also a really significant um, sort of aspect of graft host disease in the mouth. And, you know, dry mouth, it's a fairly nonspecific symptom. So sometimes, you know, somebody who is uh, undergoing transplant may have already had dry mouth symptoms because of some other treatment they've undergone or because of medications they're taking. Um, but then the transplant alone can actually cause a significant amount of dry mouth symptoms. It's usually fairly temporary, regardless of whether there's um, total body irradiation or just chemotherapy. But then when the graft first host disease sort of hits, it can attack the salivary glands. And that can be sort of a very acute onset of dry mouth symptoms. And it's not just the dry mouth, but as I'll talk about um, shortly, the, the, the complications related to dry mouth in particular affecting the teeth. And then last but not least, unfortunately, we always have to highlight that there is risk of cancer in the mouth. And um, I don't like my patients to sort of, you know, think about this over and over and worry about it, but it is important that there's an awareness um, that, you know, 
patients can oftentimes be sort of the best, you know, initial indicator that there's something that might not be normal going on. So I alluded to this, but this is actually, you know, data that gets presented um, routinely sort of in the context of graft host disease um, academically. But this is a very large study that was looking at just the different areas of involvement in, graphers, in, in patients affected by graft host disease. And I'm not sure how well you can read, but skin and mouth are the two most frequent, so affecting upwards of 70, 80% of patients who develop graft host disease. So it's very common. As far as the, the, the clinical features, what's interesting, at least from, I don't know if it's so interesting from a patient standpoint, but at least to understand this, and from my standpoint as an oral medicine specialist who treats many other conditions other than just graft host disease, it essentially resembles other conditions that we otherwise see in the clinic. So the rash-like uh, condition um, is a, almost exactly the same as a condition called lichen planus, um, which is why we use that term lichenoid inflammation. Lichen planus affects the skin also. It can affect um, the, the, the genital mucosa, um, just like graft host disease can affect all these areas. Um, there's a condition called Sjogren's syndrome, which is an autoimmune disease that essentially attacks the salivary glands and the lacrimal glands, but, but also has other, um, other areas of involvement. That condition essentially is just like what we see with graft host disease, um, essentially causing dry mouth symptoms and, again, the consequences of dry mouth. And then scleroderma, again, it's an autoimmune condition, you know, very potentially severe autoimmune condition. Um, the, the cutaneous involvement of graft host disease can sort of develop into a sclerodermatous type disease. Um, some of you have probably, you know, had to deal with, with some aspects of this. And in some cases, fortunately not very commonly, but it can affect the mouth, either inside the mouth or more commonly affecting the skin on the outside of the mouth. Um, for any of you that were at Dr. Rich's talk, um, she talked about how some patients may have limited mouth opening because of that involvement and the tightness. There's no question it impacts quality of life. Um, you know, if somebody can't eat because food is uncomfortable, someone can't drink, someone can't swallow comfortably, um, if it's difficult to eat and speak just because of the dry mouth symptoms, um, if there's problems with the teeth requiring many trips to the dentist and costs related to that, potentially loss of teeth and having to deal with replacing missing teeth, you know, all that obviously can have a significant impact on, um, on how a patient just, you know, feels and functions on a regular, on a regular basis. And then importantly, and it's not to say that graft host disease in the mouth is always going to be refractory to systemic disease, a systemic therapy, but I think it's probably, some of you would probably be able to attest to this, that sometimes, you know, the treatment can be very effective. And for instance, a skin rash resolves, the patient has liver involvement, you know, the lab tests come back, everything's normalized, um, but the mouth just doesn't get better. And so... It, it just points to the fact that there's a really important role for what we call ancillary care for the mouth. So using oftentimes, you know, very similar medications that we use systemically, but applying them in a topical manner, but also thinking about other things just related to, you know, how to approach um, eating and meals and things like that. So um, I think the room's small enough. You can probably see pretty well without making it too dark in here. But these are just typical examples of graft host disease affecting the oral cavity and the lips. And <clears throat> excuse me, when I referred to lichenoid inflammation, it's these sort of really characteristic red and white changes um, that we refer to. So the, it's interesting, the white changes, if you actually, we don't generally do a biopsy to make a diagnosis because it's, it's actually a really easy diagnosis to make. Again, it's clinical context. We know that the time frame is right. Maybe there's other areas of involvement that are already developing, but, you know, in that context, we're very comfortable making this diagnosis. There's really nothing else that looks like this. Um, but we have areas where basically the tissue gets much thicker than normal, which is why it looks white, but then it also gets much thinner than normal, which is why it looks red. And then you get these areas here where it looks sort of yellowish, like there's this film, and these are what we call ulcers, and that's where the, the tissue is actually completely missing. So in areas with very active disease, you can go from no overlying tissue to very thick tissue, and it just switches right next to each other. And why that happens, we don't understand very well. 
we tend to tend to think that these ulcers are the most symptomatic but interestingly in some patients that's not going to be the case and it's just this generalized even these types of changes the white little bit of red that can cause just as significant symptoms um, and you can see that the lips when affected can have these very you know almost identical red and white changes um, areas where the tissue will actually break down and ulcerate this is a, a quote I like to include, and I think it's just as relevant for patients, caregivers, as, as if I'm giving this lecture to um, physicians and nurses. But this was written by someone who is sort of referred to as the sort of the, the father or grandfather of, of, of oral graft versus disease, somebody who was on sort of the front lines back in the earlier days of, of, of transplant and actually is still in practice um, in Seattle and someone I know very well. But I'll just read this out loud. He said, they wrote, well, oral lesions are most common in patients with extensive chronic GVHD, meaning involvement of you know, skin, liver, eyes, other areas. Patients in our and other centers have been described who have limited disease involving only the oral cavity. In addition, we've noted that the oral cavity can be the site of persistent activity after the resolution of chronic GVHD affecting other sites. And so this is very common. I may see patients where it's the first area of involvement there's nothing else happening. Um, you know, the physician is, is really reluctant to start any systemic therapy because they don't want to put the patient on steroids yet, but the mouth can actually be, you know, really, really active. And so we have an initial sort of, you know, goal of trying to control and manage the, the symptoms without putting a patient on systemic therapy. But I also, it's very common that somebody is off of all their immunosuppressive therapy. It may be, um, you know, six, seven, I've got patients now I'm following 12, 13, 14 years after transplant. They've done great, you know, they're surviving. Um, they have no other areas of active uh, GVHD. They don't require systemic therapy, but the mouth actually continues to be active requiring, you know, daily treatment with topical steroids. So this is sort of a busy slide and I just show this to demonstrate those sort of three different components of graft versus host disease affecting the mouth and thinking of them as almost different conditions, except that they obviously can overlap. So the first is the mucosal, and this is that what we call that lichenoid inflammation. This is the rash-like change. Um, this is typically going to be primary, the, 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 um, the, the involvement that's primarily responsible for the mouth being uncomfortable, for there being pain, um, in particular there being sensitivity, so eating, drinking certain foods and drinks, sometimes things that you wouldn't even expect to be uncomfortable, um, something that just has a little bit of acidity to it, a little bit of sort of extra flavoring, a little bit of seasoning, a little bit of spice um, that just will set the mouth off. And, you know, we ask patients, you know, a zero to ten scale for symptoms. And I have patients like the one, you know, that the, the pointer's on right now. At rest, they will report zero out of ten. Mouth feels fine. Everything's perfectly comfortable. If they put their tongue against the ulcer, it's not painful at all. I can examine them, I can put a glove finger against it, it's not painful. But they go to eat or drink something, and immediately it goes to a 10, like in a second. And that's very typical for the, for the mucosal involvement. In some cases, if, that, if those white changes are, are really intense, the mouth can feel very tight. Um, sometimes it can affect taste. The salivary changes can affect taste also, so again, there's all this sort of overlapping. Um, with, and in some cases, the, the mucosal disease can actually scar over time and eventually lead to these types of changes inside the mouth just due to um, these sort of fibrous changes that affect the, the inside of the mouth. With the salivary changes, it's much more dry mouth, difficulty speaking, difficulty um, chewing certain foods, especially drier foods, breadier foods, meats, um, difficulty swallowing. So again, sometimes the esophagus can be affected, so we don't want to be, we have to be careful not to attribute all swallowing problems just to salivary changes, but you can imagine if you don't have enough moisture, if you don't have enough lubrication, the food just doesn't go down well, um, and it can actually get stuck at times. Um, the having less saliva can make the mouth more sensitive, so very similar symptoms. Sometimes we see patients that have those same sensitivity symptoms despite there being no obvious lichenoid changes in the mouth. Um, and then the, the real, I'd say, you know, the, the, the main sort of clinical outcome problem is the risk of dental caries. And having less saliva 
increases the risk of cavities, and in particular, and I'll, sh I'll show you some more pictures of this, but in particular around the gum line in between the teeth, areas that oftentimes, you know, you can't really see very well. Um, and this is just related to the fact that saliva plays a really important role in actually just generally cleansing the mouth, flushing out sort of debris, um, also, also something we call um, uh, remineralization. So there's actually components in the saliva that help sort of continually sort of rebuild back up the teeth. And without that, there's sort of this, you know, um, un unequal, unequal equation. Um, with the sclerodermatous changes, it's basically tightness. So mouth opening becomes difficult. Um, it's difficult sometimes just to perform normal oral hygiene, you know, to get a toothbrush far enough back, to be able to get back there with, um, with dental floss, or to go to the dentist's office and to have a good exam, to be able to have the, the dental care actually delivered um, in a, you know, in a, um, in effective manner. It's really difficult if you can barely get the mouth open and barely see. Um, and rarely it can actually cause significant amount of pain. So there were, um, in the, the um, cutaneous and connective tissue talk, there were some questions about, you know, cramping and tightness and things like that. And that's actually what that picture is showing up there. This is a patient who is experiencing just basically spontaneous um, spasms and cramps. Not common, but related to that um, intense sclerodermatous changes and the effects on the muscle. So we'll talk about um, management of each of these. I mean, again, diagnosis, there may be a role for biopsy in some cases, but the, in the vast majority of cases, I'm not going to be doing a biopsy. Um, I can make this diagnosis clinically. Um, in the past, there was some interest and focus on doing what are called minor salivary gland biopsies. I don't know if anyone here ever underwent that, but it's basically just getting some salivary gland tissue from inside the lip. Um, it was actually um, years ago proposed as a way to actually screen for the onset of graft disease, but it's not something that we routinely do because, again, we can make the diagnosis and ultimately the treatments, you know, we, we're going to use regardless of what these tests show. So for mucosal disease, we have um, topical steroids. This is really our mainstay of treatment. And from the, the, the general considerations are really how extensive is it? Um, how, uh, so how extensive is it? Where are the areas of involvement? What's going to be the most effective way to apply the steroid? Um, how severe are the symptoms? So how intensively do we need to treat this? And what are we looking for as far as a response? You know, so what can I educate the patient, caregiver to be, to be thinking about? And also what types of complications might arise? So gels work very well in the mouth. Um, on the skin, you're, you're probably being prescribed generally an ointment or a cream because um, those tend to penetrate into the skin much better. In the mouth, it's a wet environment, and gels work very well in a wet environment. So we can use a gel. Um, the ones we tend to use are clobetazole and fluocinonide. These are sort of at the highest levels, basically, just at the two highest levels of potency. Um, I know that probably some of you have been given or have heard of um, the triamcinolone dental paste. That was mentioned during the, um, the skin talk. It's certainly an, a, a prescription that's available, but it doesn't tend to be all that effective because it's really just not a very potent steroid. So our approach is generally use something that's more potent that actually can be used potentially even less uh, aggressively and less intensively. So it makes it much easier. If you can apply something once a day versus six times a day, you know, again, getting back to just quality of life, let alone effectiveness of treatment, um, these are all important considerations. If we use gels, so for instance, if I were trying to treat, you know, that patient earlier with a big ulcer on the cheek, um, I will generally have them use a piece of gauze so they can get some, you know, you can get gauze at the, at the drugstore and actually apply it as a bandage and put it on and leave it there for five or ten minutes. It'll keep the medicine in the right place um, much more effectively. Otherwise, even for somebody who has salivary gland involvement, you're going to have some wetness in the mouth and it's going to tend to sort of run and sort of, you know, um, uh, get more, more diffuse. In general, though, I, I use solutions much more frequently than, than gels. Gels I'll actually generally use almost more as a secondary treatment after applying a rinse, a solution. Solutions are just very easy to apply, and you can, you can sort of apply it to the entire mouth without having to put your fingers in and try and put things everywhere. And then some of the areas that are more difficult to reach, like the back part of the corner of the cheeks where is oftentimes affected, 
um, the, the back sides of the tongue, underside of the tongue, um, the roof of the mouth. You know, I mean, it's just not easy to get a medicine all over the place. Solutions work very well. Dexamethasone is the one that's most widely used, at least in the, Uni in the United States. It's, it's a very simple reason. It's commercially available. It's not intended to be used as a topical medication. It's really, it's just a, a solution form of otherwise an oral medication. But it, it's, it, it can be, uh, it, it's a very good vehicle for the oral, um, uh, oral rinsing. And it's a very potent steroid. So it actually tends to work very well and tends to be our first line treatment. Um, it can be used anywhere for up to four times a day. In some cases, I have patients who will even go five or six times a day, but generally up to four times a day. Um, depending on the severity, again, I may start once a day, I may start twice a day, or I may have someone start right off four times a day. Um, and then the five minute contact time, it's not that scientific to the extent that I can tell you we've done studies where you know one minute versus three minutes versus five minutes versus 10 minutes, but there's no question that 10 seconds or 30 seconds versus three to five minutes is potentially like night and day as far as you know being on one milligram of prednisone versus 60 or 70 milligrams of prednisone. You just, you will not get the same response. And so, so sometimes I have patients re, uh, referred to me and it's not to say that the, the transplant physician wasn't paying enough attention, but again, they're covering you know every aspect of the patient's care and then it gets to the mouth. Okay, did I get the prescription? Did I tell them what to do with it? Great, you know, they're all set. And then they, they're, they're not getting better. They're referred to me. The first question I ask is, what are you doing? So, well, you know, it's obvious. It's on my medication list. But tell me what you're doing. And they tell me, you know, I keep it in. How long? About 10 seconds. Okay, you're going to go to five minutes, and I'll see you in a month. And just doing that alone is a complete turnaround. Not always, but oftentimes that might be the case. The other ones that I have listed there, clobetazole and budesonide, are in italics because they have to be compounded. So again, dexamethasone is sort of our first line go-to treatment because it's widely available, works well, and you don't have to go through compounding. If a prescription, if dexamethasone is not sufficiently effective, then we have to go to something that's more potent, and these are basically the options. I mean, there's other things that potentially could be compounded, but based on either my experience and or what's in the literature, these are basically my two go-to treatments. Yeah. So, so all of the topical steroids, not the only one that is FDA approved for use in the mouth is the triamcinolone dental paste. It's the only one. So that will say apply to the mouth. Every other treatment will actually say not for internal use. It may specifically say not for use in the mouth. And so we actually, we have information sheets we give our patients. I'm pretty sure that they're gonna be distributed somehow through this meeting. Um, and it, there's a section that talks about the treatments and then very specifically, you know, it will say this. Sometimes we even get a, you know, a call from a pharmacy. You know, what are you doing? What's this for? So, yeah. And the same thing for the, in the lips, I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, we use uh, the topical tacrolimus ideally for the lips because the steroids, the reason they don't, you know, those, those warnings for using the high potency steroids on the face is it can cause, you know, significant thinning of the skin, especially the face and the lips. So, you know, for a very short period, if somebody's prescription can't get filled, by all means, I'll have them use it. But if they're going to be using it for weeks, potentially months, potentially years, um, I very much prefer the, um, the pro topic. All right, I got to keep, yeah, quick question and then I can keep I moving. Just wanted to say that um, they have to compound my dexamethasone without the alcohol. Okay. It's very effective. Yeah, ex absolutely. Because you put the alcohol in it, it's battery acid. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And I could get into more specifics about the clobetazole and budesonide, but I'll probably save it for questions if people have questions. And I I'm happy to provide, you know, email and, and answer questions. Um, tacrolimus works really well for the lips. In some cases, we actually will have that compounded into an oral solution because the only, um, the only uh, commercial form formulation of topical tacrolimus is in an ointment. So putting an ointment in the mouth is very difficult and especially if we're trying to treat widely, uh, we know that it can be an effective treatment together with steroids. So in, in my more severe cases, I may have them using clobetazole solution and tacrolimus solution, equal parts together as a combined rinse. And in some cases, I can get very good response with that where I wouldn't get the same response with either one alone um, or certainly with dexamethasone alone. Interlesional steroid therapy, I'm just mentioning quickly, it's actually giving an injection of steroid into the tissue for patients who have really persistent ulcers that are painful, 
it can work incredibly well, and I have a certain cohort of my patients that, you know, just need to be seen on sort of a regular basis just to get those injections because the treatments otherwise just aren't nearly as effective. And putting someone on, for instance, high doses of steroids, you will not get the same effect as actually delivering um, right to the area. As far as avoiding food, you know, everyone figures out the things to avoid. A, a really um, important uh, little tidbit is using a children's toothpaste. It can, you know, the children's toothpaste don't have the same components in them that cause the kind of burning that an adult toothpaste does. It works perfectly well. Um, these are just examples showing sort of before and after treatment. You can see um, on the left side is before treatment, add this after just a month of treatment, and you can actually see really significant clinical improvement, which will tend to go together with uh, improvement in symptoms. The, the main complication of using a topical steroid is that uh, a secondary yeast infection can develop. Um, if somebody's already on an antifungal medication because they've been on prophylaxis, it's very unlikely this is going to happen. Although if it's only nystatin, the topical rinse uh, antifungal treatment, we can sometimes see infection develop despite that. Um, but it's, you know, it, it typically develops within a week or so of using a topical steroid in the mouth if it's going to develop. It has this characteristic sort of white splotchy appearance. Um, very easy for us to treat with medication like fluconazole that, you know, many of you are probably already being treated with. Um, it also can be a side of a, a complication of just the dry mouth. So patients who have um, significant involvement of salivary glands may actually be at significant risk for recurrent yeast infections as well, even if they're not using a topical steroid. You can imagine if you have sort of all these factors together, then somebody's at, you know, very high risk. And we'll uh, I'll oftentimes have patients on um, a systemic antifungal agent like fluconazole, but we don't necessarily need to treat every day, sometimes just once a week or twice a week can be enough to actually keep the infection from coming back. And for those of you on other medications, um, you know, you probably know that, you know, being on a medication like tacrolimus can affect sort of the levels of some of these other medications. So we try to keep at least um, the regimens as stable as, as possible. Herpes simplex virus infection is completely different from graft host disease in the mouth, but, you know, the mouth is an area that um, can commonly be affected, so lips inside the mouth. It's not so much related to use of topical steroids and or even graft versus host disease in the mouth is just immunosuppression. So being immunosuppressed puts, you know, a patient at increased risk for the, the virus reactivating. Um, and sometimes even if you take your acyclovir regularly, it can still reactivate despite that, and we have to go to higher doses. So it sometimes can be a little bit difficult to discern the difference between graft versus host disease that's getting worse and, um, you know, flaring perhaps versus uh, herpes recrudescence, which is actually sort of um, peeking through on top of the graft versus host disease. And these are examples. So this is a patient who has what you can see looks like graft versus host disease changes of the tongue, um, who then developed these multiple little um, sort of vesicular ulcers, very, very painful, you know, abruptly painful, whereas they otherwise had been very stable and much more painful than any ulcers they had typically had related to the graft versus host disease. When that's the case, it's a pretty easy diagnosis to make. Um, but again, you know, if you're dealing with graft versus host disease in the mouth, something changes, anything, I mean, you should always, you know, check with your doctor. Someone should take a look and hopefully be able to identify. I'm almost wrapped up, and I promise we'll have time for questions. Um, salivary gland involvement, again, we've talked about most of this. So the function of saliva, it does a lot of things that we sort of take for granted. And so when there's less saliva, you know, all these, all these different sort of aspects can, can suffer. Um, and the, the sort of the silent one that we don't really think about it, that, that kind of creeps up on us is the, the effect on the teeth. Um, and so seeing the dentist regularly is, is very critical. These are examples um, of just showing, these are some of the early changes that can be seen along the gum line where it has this sort of most frosted appearance. Um, this is evident that basically the teeth are essentially demineralizing and eventually we can see the actual dental caries, these sort of yellowish orangish changes along the gum line. Here's a patient where, you know, nearly every tooth has been affected. Um, and this isn't going to be painful unless there's actually an infection. So catching this early on, noting that somebody's at risk um, and intervening as early as possible um, is really the most, most important thing we can do. So we can manage symptoms with saliva substitutes, over-the-counter products. I'm sure many of you are aware of them. There's prescription um, sialagog therapy, so actual medications that you can take that will help the salivary glands produce more saliva. 
Um, it's not an immunosuppressive therapy, so it's, it's, it's fairly specific for the glands. Um, can help the eyes as well in some cases. And then addressing the risk of dental caries is most important, so just making sure that there's brushing, flossing, ideally after every meal, but certainly twice a day. Um, use of prescription fluoride at home. So this is just you know, basically painting on or using trays to apply a fluoride gel. Um, sometimes patients are given a, a prescription fluoride toothpaste as well. Um, fluoride can be applied at the dentist office. They can apply something called fluoride varnish or other types of fluoride applications. Fluoride basically helps make the teeth more resistant to that demineralization process. Um, having bite wing radiographs, so the ones where the, patient, where the dentist asks you to sort of bite down and smile a little bit, those basically are, are these that show these in-between changes. And you know, ideally, we don't want to see changes like this you know, at a year out of transplant when somebody's going back to the dentist perhaps for the first time. So within six to 12 months after transplant, getting to the dentist and making sure in addition to a, a good exam, a cleaning, but also to have these x-rays done. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about very briefly, not to put a lot of focus on this, but you know, um, patients are at risk for developing secondary cancers. Skin and mouth, unfortunately, are the two most common for solid cancers, and we think that that actually is really directly related to graft-versus-host disease being a risk factor. So graft-versus-host disease, as we talked about, primarily affects skin and mouth most frequently. These are areas um, where um, that tissue is at risk for developing into cancer. On the skin, we know that sun exposure is a major risk factor in, as well. Lips also. So protecting the lips is very important, but inside the mouth, there's, it's not a sun exposure risk. It's just um, hopefully somebody has not smoked or doesn't smoke because we know smoking is the number one risk factor uh, for mouth cancer. But you know, for transplant patients with history of graft-versus-host disease, in particular graft-versus-host disease in the mouth, the risk is somewhat stratospheric compared to normal healthy population. So it's still a very small risk. But compared with you know, your spouse, family members, whoever else, um, it's much, much higher. And oftentimes it can be, and, and unfortunately it's a risk that just sort of continues to develop and um, increase with time. So the better you do, the longer you live, the healthier you are, you know, unfortunately that risk doesn't go away. Um, and these are just examples. You know, I showed you what graft-versus-host disease looks like already. And in some cases, you know, when cancer develops, it'll develop in an area where there's actually active or has been active graft versus disease. Um, areas sometimes where there's just persistent white changes that we follow that seem stable. We don't know exactly what to do with. Um, so it's, it's just really important that, you know, you're sort of self-aware, examined to some extent without dwelling on it, um, but also that, you know, the dentist is aware that, you know, not just you're a transplant patient, but, you know, really at significant risk. So, if there's something that seems a little bit out of the ordinary, um, you've been aware of something that seems to be kind of growing, it's thicker, it's rougher than normal um, in an area where that was never the case before, bring it to somebody's attention. doesn't mean that every single lesion needs to be biopsied. Um, and depending on somebody's sort of level of experience, expertise, you know, I may not biopsy as many things that somebody out in the community may want to biopsy. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but, you know, we want to catch something like this as much as possible early on because we know that if we can treat, if we can remove, if it's a small area that we can actually, you know, I know it sounds gross, but, you know, cut out and, and actually eliminate, um, oftentimes that will be sufficient and it won't come back again. Um, if it's, you know, presenting at a much more advanced stage, just like in a non-transplant uh, population, it's going to be much more difficult to manage. So. Um, so in summary, and then we'll have time for some questions, uh, graft host disease can be the initial site. It may be the last site. It can be persistent. Wide range of symptoms, again, depending on sort of what kind of graft host disease you have in the mouth. Um, management, again, it's going to be really directed towards what the symptoms are, what the, what the clinical features are, um, but are going to involve sort of all of these, um, all these different approaches. Um, seeing the dentist is really important. I know sometimes there's sort of this this um, almost uh, m uh, uh, misperception that it's not safe to go to the dentist. And so I'll see a patient and it's two or three years after transplant and they still haven't been back to the dentist. And maybe I'm seeing for the first time and they have some clear, you know, obvious dental caries and it just would have been nice if we could have you know, addressed that a year and a half earlier, perhaps. Um, and then 
just at least being aware that um, you know there's this risk for oral cancer and at least understanding some of the things to be aware of. These are just slides that you have in your handouts um, talking about some of the prescriptions we talked about, some of the um, long-term sort of screening guidelines for graft-versus disease in the mouth, and then um, just a reference to some of the resources that you have available. So we'll stop there. I had a few questions while we were going, but we still have time for at least, I think, 20 minutes or so for questions. So great. Thanks. All right. We'll try and keep it on the mic so we can yeah. get it for everyone else. It was a great talk. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have two questions, really. Um, one is, um, or maybe a comment, I've had dentures pre-transplant with implants pre-transplant, but I've noticed since transplant, I'm three and a half years out, the plaque amount around the implants and on the dentures has increased tremendously. Is this part of GVHD or is this part of the aging process? So it's a very good question. I would say that if you had, if you know, you had this stable prosthesis for some extended period of time, and that was never the case, then it's probably uh, a result of changes in the salivary glands. So there, you know, even if you're, I, 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 does your mouth seem particularly dry or not really? So, so especially yes. if it feels dry, then that's a that's probably our best indicator that the salivary glands are involved. But I've actually had patients that have presented into my clinic with um, the really extensive dental disease, like I was talking about, mm -hmm. who had perfect teeth before transplant. You know, nothing changed about their diet. They've been maintaining good hygiene, but um, they actually weren't even aware of having dry mouth symptoms. And there, so so we think of sort of both quantitative changes. So you kind of like turning off the faucet, but also qualitative changes. And these are sort of like the silent changes that even if the mouth doesn't feel dry, or sometimes the mouth may feel really dry to the patient, but we look in the mouth and it looks like there's plenty of saliva, it's because the, the components are altered. And to some extent, that's probably a, the explanation for what's going on. So the, I mean, the good news is, is they're, they're implants, mm -hmm. so you're not at risk for caries, mm -hmm. but, but you are at risk for you know, potentially problems around the implants and having to go in and have them cleaned on a more, recent basis, uh, on a more um, routine basis. All right, the other item I had was um, about a year ago, January, I had a blister inside my mouth that traveled to outside my mouth, and I wound up being hospitalized for three days because it spread to my face. Hmm. They were never able to identify it, but they put me on a full range of antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral. Where, where was the opening on the outside of the face? Like, uh, my upper lip. Like you, like this something this was swelling. So the, the, what, what happened on the outside? Though? I had, um, it was like the whole front of my lip became yeah. all um, encrusted. Hmm. And then it started going up the side of my face, and that's when we went to the hospital. And then at, by the end of the, end of the day, because this was like two days at that point, the swelling had gone up to my eyes, and my eye looked like I was in a fight and lost. Hmm. The and, there, and there was, was no, so and no tooth was identified as the cause. No, you didn't have teeth. No, this was way. This was two years post transplant, and I had the dentures back in '96. Yeah. So many years difference. I, I'd be, I'd be completely speculating. Did they, did they give you an idea of what they thought the infection was from? They I mean, took biopsy yeah. and they did tests, and even a week later, getting more long-term testing done. They were never able to come up with anything. Hmm. And it seemed to start in the lip area. It started internally yeah. on the inside of my lip. And then I don't know if I ate something or burned it, but it just wound up like within two days. It was almost like a cold sore, yeah. but then it spread from like the corner of my mouth to the front half. But there was, but there was swelling, you said, the right? The swelling on my yeah, cheeks, cold, my cold ears, my face. Like that. Exactly. I mean, it went up into my head. My eye was swollen shut. I mean, I, I posted on Facebook to my family, and I said, I look like I was in a fight and lost. I mean, that's yeah. how bad it yeah. was. Yeah, well, I mean, the good news I can say for everyone else in the room is whatever this was, this was not a typical infection. So um, what it was directly related to, I'm not sure. I've seen a few cases of sort of fairly atypical infections affecting these minor salivary glands. So your main, the, the main salivary glands, you've got big ones here and underneath the, um, the jaw but you've got little ones all throughout the mouth. So any of you that have experienced those little blisters that come and go, those are related to the minor salivary glands. 
Um, and I've, I've had a few patients that have actually had infections develop within the minor salivary glands, so causing swelling, but never leading to, yeah, you know, yeah, the entire yeah. face. Well, I'm, I'm glad it resolved. Hopefully it never happens again. Hi. Um, I'm about eight months post-transplant, and um, I'm on the dexamethasone mouthwash. And I, uh, I went to go see a dentist because I noticed staining on my teeth. Is there a way, and he thinks it's related to the mouthwash, is there a way to help get rid of the stains? Because I'm still on all the autoimmune suppressants, so my bone marrow doctors recommended not to get a cleaning yet because of the risk of infection. Yeah, so, so, so that kind of got back to this, you know, there, there are these thoughts out there, but they're not really based on any real, like, hard data. Um, in general, unless you're, I mean, you look, I mean, don't take this wrong, but you, you look you look very well today. I mean, oh, you're, you're here thanks. and you're, you know, in hopefully enjoying yourself at the conference. Um, there's no reason that you can't go to the dentist at this point. Uh, so okay, so it's safe for me to get a, a so cleaning you, now, you think? Be. No, of okay. course, you know, you need to talk to your, your transplant physician, but you can say, you know, Dr. Treister did say that, you know, at about six months, I mean, if you're otherwise well enough, it should be perfectly appropriate to go to the dentist. I mean, one thing that we'll suggest, and it's no different than going to another doctor's office, um, potentially, you know, asking to be like the first patient to be seen, so you're not sitting in the waiting room with a whole bunch of, you know, sick, you know, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds, um, or sick adults, you know, <laughs> and you can just kind of get in and out. Um, I mean, that's ideal, but um, but you should be able to go see the dentist. As far as the staining goes, were you have you been and or are you still using a rinse called um, Paradex or Chlorhexidine? Yes. So that that's what's causing the staining. And it's completely superficial. So if it, if, if and when you get your teeth cleaned, it'll all disappear. But the dexamethasone doesn't cause any staining. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just a quick comment to follow up on his question. I had AML. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. we can hear. I had AML in 1997. And it kind of took me a year before I went to see the dentist, too, because I was kind of sick. And when I finally went, my bone marrow transplant doctor actually encouraged me to go. Mm -hmm. And um, this I, is a year after your transplant? Yes, a year after. And uh, at the time, I bled a lot with cleaning. I, my mouth was on fire. They had to numb it and mm -hmm. give me payment. But I got my dental checkup done. Good. And so I was fine but I still had the gravasus host and the dry mouth, and I had a couple cavities, lost a few teeth, but my oral health is good now, knock on wood. Mm -hmm. But it is a good thing to go early, even though cleaning is not going to be comfortable. Yeah, it can and you be may right. bleed, it and can they may have to numb you. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes yeah. If, if we feel, so I've had patients, I, I just had a patient recently, and they're, they're years out, but just very active graphosus host disease, a lot of things going on in the mouth um, with some, some of the most inflamed gums I've ever seen in a graphic host disease patient, to the extent I've actually biopsied twice because I was worried that there was something else going on, um, and every time just came back as just severe inflammation. Um, so the patient is, it, you know, has so much inflammation, it makes it so difficult to actually be able to get back there and, you know, maintain the hygiene. So this patient I actually put on high-dose prednisone, specifically for the gums to get the mouth under control, and then have the patient in the context of that treatment go to the dentist, have a, you know, a, a really intensive cleaning, and then we also um, sort of prescribed or recommended, you know, using these specific types of brushes to get back into some of these really tough problem areas. Um, and so, you know, you know going in that there's still going to be a certain amount of bleeding and discomfort. Um, you might have to use, you know, local anesthetic, like you said, or have a patient rinse with, um, you know, with a numbing medication at, before the before the treatment. But getting the cleaning done is such a critical step to allow the the, the gingival tissue to actually become healthy. And I've in this patient now we've seen a phenomenal response. So a very good point. Thank you. What percentage of the mucosa, treated mucosal lesions progress to sclerotic? It's a, it's a really good question. Fortunately, it's actually very rare. Um, I have 
I have a, a, a small number of, I mean, sort of accumulating, you know, cases we sort of keep track of. But if I had, you know, 100 patients with really significant, you know, disease that we were sort of treating, following, managing over time, I would be surprised if, you know, 10 or less developed any real fibrosis. And of those, like maybe one or two where it's a, like actually a real problem, like, you know, this is causing issues, we might need to think about, is there something I can do surgically to actually help improve this in some way? Um, so fortunately, it doesn't scar that much in the mouth. I, I don't have a good reason why. And then the patients who do, um, especially if they don't have that type of scarring changes on the skin elsewhere, we don't really know, you know, what it is that triggers it. The other part of the question, from your own experience, what percentage of the mouth lesions go away with time? That's or, kind of, so that's a, I mean, that's a great question. I would, I would say that the majority do, um, but we don't have a great long-term, you know, like here's the natural history of these, you know, 100, 200 patients we followed over, over this many years. Um, we thought about doing it at one point. We never really actually got the project off the ground. Uh, it's, it's a good question. So, so but I think it, it's, it has almost two answers. One is what proportion of patients does it just sort of like truly burn out and disappear? Some of those that absolutely die. I mean, just saw a patient for follow-up. I was treating actually quite intensively. Um, had come back for six month follow-up, just saw in clinic last week. And I mean, there's not a hint of those white lacy changes in the mouth anymore. So we just stop treatment. If we feel symptoms coming back, we'll restart treatment. But I mean, there's, there's no evidence right now. It may come back again at another time. Other patients, it can just persist like we talked about and actually require treatment for, you know, decades. Um, and then in some patients, which I didn't talk about here very much, um, but sometimes we just get sort of residual changes. And so it's not really active graft resource disease. It's not uncomfortable. It's not symptomatic. You know, the patient doesn't, they're not aware of it. But there will just be a, a solitary white area, um, sometimes very well, descri very well circumscribed. Other times it's a little bit more diffuse, as if there's just sort of some persistent typical graft host disease changes, certain areas that tend to be sort of more commonly affected than others. Um, and those may never go away, but they also may never change or turn into anything else. So we tend to think that, you know, a persistent white lesion is something that we potentially need to be worried about, we need to keep an eye on, we think could potentially have some risk of turning into a, a, a cancerous lesion, but, you know, most of these white changes that we follow are just sort of long-term changes that will never go away. Yeah. Yeah. You had, that sl you had the slide with the three conditions. The first one was the like the side of the mouth. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you had the thing with the on the tongue. Yeah. And uh, you could have used pictures out of my mouth, I think, <laughs> for that stuff. And right now, I've got that white stuff, my wife tells me, and uh, I've had it for a few weeks, and um, my d doctor took a biopsy of it a week ago. It'll be two weeks tomorrow. I don't have the results yet. But uh, you were saying, a, you a said, biopsy, like using a, a swab. Yeah, yeah I so call the, it biopsy, they took, they took but a culture. Culture. Yeah. yeah. So they're just, they're just testing the surface, yeah. and they're trying to rule out that there's a yeast infection by doing that. Okay. So this week I'll find out about that, but in the meantime I've been miserable. And then, so he, he increased my acyclovir to five, 800 milligrams for five days. So the reason he did so, right, so the concern was was that you're having, um, what we My call tongue is horrible. <laughs> uh, herpes infection. I'm, I'm happy to take a look when we're, when we're done. Um, if you're taking your acyclovir regularly, it's unlikely. I talked about that there can be what we call sure. breakthrough infections, but right. they're not common. Mm -hmm. We just have to be aware of it because it does happen. Right. Um, so the idea of increasing the acyclovir was just in case that's what's going on, yep. we're going to cover that. Right. Culture was probably just doing a culture for virus then and not yep. um, right. a fungal culture. So just a, a little take-home point, you know, the mouth is full of stuff <laughs> for most patients. And it doesn't mean there's an infection. So doing a culture alone that comes back positive doesn't actually tell us there's an infection. Yeah. Even with herpes, a positive culture doesn't absolutely tell us that it's an infection, but it's a really, really good indicator. Um, but if it's just been for a few weeks, it's white, it's uncomfortable, it's 
I, how long after transplant are you? Two years. Okay, and you've, have you ever had involvement in the mouth before? I had the, well, I, uh, the sides I had, yeah. and I, I've gone through photophoresis therapy. I'm in like the seventh week, yeah. and that cleared up. Okay. Uh, and my, my and every, the photophoresis worked and improved many, you know, like everything, but yeah. my tongue got a hundred times worse in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm happy to take a look. And, yeah. and, and you just started well, the uh, higher dose acyclovir? You just started uh, it? Saturday, yeah. yeah. Hi, I do the uh, dexamethasone swish uh, every day, and uh, it, it's supposed to be a, a topical type of steroid, but that's the only steroid uh, I'm currently taking, and I, I see I'm, I'm getting uh, steroid type um, effects. Effects. What, what have you noticed? Oh, like the hair and the nails grow really fast. And, yeah. and that's been the case when you were on steroids before. Yeah. So, yeah. so you may be absorbing some. You know, we, 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 we expect that the majority of the effect is a local topical effect. In most patients, we don't see any evidence of um, systemic effects, but we definitely do in some. And when we go to those more highly potent ones that I listed, like mm -hmm. uh, we have clobetazole uh, compounded, in some cases, we can see there being, you know, systemic effects. If somebody's on steroids also, one, it's very difficult to determine, you know, what's causing what. And also, we don't generally see that there's a, like, an obvious additive effect. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I certainly have patients like you that where that's the case. Okay. And so, you know, we try to minimize the, the application but still get as much, you know, benefit as possible. A trade-off. Yeah. Thank you. It could be, and I could be a reason to consider something like, you know, adding um, the topical tacrolimus, like I was talking about, um, if the if the if the steroid side effects were, you know, problematic. Because the idea is, I mean, if if it's getting absorbed, then we would expect that if we use tacrolimus, some of that's going to get absorbed also. Yeah. So it's just a matter of, you know, how to balance those systemic um, side effects. I do the dexamethasone yep. swish too, um, but I get it on the outside of my mouth as well. And my lips peel mm, when I have a flare; they peel every day. Yeah. I'm told just to take a cotton swab and do the dexamethasone on the outside of my so, mouth. So again, if if it's if it's a little bit here and there, it's probably not a big deal, but. Over the long run, like if it's something that, you know, you're kind of on and off and on and off and, it, you know, you just, you know, you're going to need to treat it on a regular enough basis, it's ideal to get the protopic prescription. So it's something you can just ask for. Yeah, yeah. So and for some, in some cases, you know, just applying protopic once a day may control things well so that you're not really having to go on and off the treatment. And it's, it's perfectly safe. Um, it can burn a little bit sometimes for some patients when you first put it on, but it works really well. I mean, the, the case I showed you where it was the, the lip involvement and then basically completely better afterwards, that's, you know, just using protopic. Are you, <coughs> are you aware of a network of doctors or dentists who are able to treat um, people um, with G, uh, or, or, um, GVHDs um, because my dentist, I'm not sure they are really familiar with it. No, you're absolutely correct. Most dentists don't have any experience in this field. Um, maybe they, you know, had a few minutes in a lecture in dental school and then unless they've gone to some sort of continuing education specifically trying to learn about this field, they're not going to have, you know, they're not, they're, they're generally not going to have a whole lot of experience. Um, there are certainly resources, you know, that they can reach out to and they can read and try and learn about. Um, we try to provide sort of that level of outreach, you know, to our community. So, um, if possible, you know, I can provide some sort of information or at least just be available for um, for referrals. But ultimately, somebody who has training in, in, in this area of oral medicine, and there's not that many of us around the country, um, is really the, you know, generally the, the best type of person to, to see. Uh, hopefully, 
at your transplant center, they will have somebody that they can refer to. In some cases, it may be a, a, you know, a skin doctor or a dermatologist who has enough experience in graft versus disease and enough interest, or they may have a, a dentist or dental team. In some cases, maybe an oral surgeon. Um, but where, where and, and it also depends too, you know, how closely you're still connected to your transplant center. You know, some, some centers, you know, maintain very close, you know, tight leash. Others, it's, you know, you may be hours away and it's not going to be nearly as easy and you're not going to go back as frequently. Where, 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 where were you transplanted? A Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, but I live in Florida. You live in Florida? Where do you live in Florida? Uh, Fort Lauderdale. Okay. So there actually is somebody you could see in Fort Lauderdale at uh, Nova Southeastern. So if you, I give you my card and if you either shoot me a note at some point and or if you just reach out directly to Nova Southeastern, they have a, um, they have a, a dental department. Within dental, they have an oral medicine uh, faculty. And I know, I know the person there very well. Thank you very much. How much experience she has directly with graft host disease I'm not entirely sure, but she'll have enough and or the, you know, sort of the, the wherewithal and resources to be able to help. Yep. Maybe one more quick one. Good. All right. All right. Anything on the biome? We are talking about all the lower parts and looking at microbiome, don't know how to fix it and everything like that. Is that a potential for research? Interesting. Uh, so, I mean, absolutely. There's, there's a lot of interest in it, but um, in from every aspect of, you know, sort of transplant and oral disease, so not just graft versus host disease, but also there's been a lot of interest in what role, if any, does the microbiome, so all these bugs in the mouth, have to do with the development of mucositis. Um, it's, you know, I mean, any work that's ongoing is very early right now, so I, there's no specific advice. I mean, I would say, you know, eat a good, healthy, balanced diet, um, brush your teeth regularly, <laughs> Unless you've been told you have to be using the Paradex mouth rinse, you know, the one that we talked about that can cause some staining, in most cases it's probably not critical. Um, I do have some patients that, you know, have, like the one I was talking about, where there's a lot of gingival involvement, and, I, you know, using that can help sort of, you know, control some of that inflammation, but um, it's really just, you know, mostly the mechanical plaque removal and flossing and just keeping everything as clean as possible. So, um, you know, bacteria are... You know, even though they cause problems, they're, they're good, and uh, they play an important role in sort of maintaining overall health and balance, so you can't get rid of all of it. 